Welcome to Channels Business Global with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Tomorrow, Saturday the 6th of May, the coronation of King Charles III will be taking place at Westminster Abbey, which is right in the heart of the British capital. The religious service, which will be conducted by Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, kickstarts a weekend of events and celebrations across this country and around the entire world. Westminster Abbey has been the setting for every coronation since 1066 and His Majesty will be the 40th sovereign to be crowned there. The UK government has refused to comment on the expected amount it will cost the British taxpayer, but some predictions have suggested it could cost anything between £100 million and £250 million. Pounds. On today's Channels Business Global, I will be bringing you up to speed on how the country is gearing up for Coronation Day. To help me, I'll be joined by a palace insider. Angela Levin, the award-winning journalist, royal biographer and author, will be sharing all of her insights about what goes on behind the gates of Buckingham Palace. As to be expected, security forces have spent months preparing for the event, which will see about 100 heads of state attending, as well as huge crowds of spectators. Police arrested a man outside Buckingham Palace on Tuesday for throwing what they believe were shotgun cartridges over the gates. Demonstrations are also planned by anti-monarchists in Trafalgar Square and along the procession route. It's a, it's a rather significant, extremely significant operation. Uh, over a period of about seven days, about 29,000 officers, uh, millions, I would suggest, of people coming into London. Our focus is keeping people safe, so we have a multi-layered protective security approach, uh, really, which consists of a, a, a very, very overt uh, element which people will see, and that consists of uh, a number of specialist departments and, and, and officers. And we are in this with, with colleagues from the British Transport Police, uh, from the City of London Police and some lots and lots of trusted partners. So this is a, a monumentous effort from, from all sorts of uh, partners uh, across London. Away from the threat, the atmosphere in London has been rather exciting. In this South London park, people got the chance to ride like King Charles in this replica of the coach used for royal coronation. And in the city, this 80-foot table was used to start an early street party. Thousands of street parties involving millions of people will be taking place over this historic weekend. The coronation may cost the British taxpayer hundreds of millions of pounds. However, according to economists, this money will come right back into the public purse, as entrepreneurs like these have been finding creative ways to boost their bottom line. And there are words like play, coronation, word, and there's several others actually, and there's a few hidden meanings inside the crown as well. So I think it's kind of fun that if people can see it spinning to be able to have a look for the words and see if you can find them. Away from the crowds, the main guest himself, King Charles, has been very busy this week. On Tuesday, he was hosted by lawmakers at Westminster Palace. And on Wednesday, together with Queen Consort Camilla, the King attended a garden party at Buckingham Palace, which had a star-studded crowd. On Saturday, there will be 2,200 guests inside Westminster Abbey, far fewer than the 8,000 in attendance for Queen Elizabeth's coronation in 1953. Now it's a time I have been eagerly anticipating some inside knowledge of the goings-on in the palace. For this, I was earlier joined in the studio by Angela Levin, an award-winning journalist, royal biographer, author, broadcaster and public speaker. Angela Levin, award-winning journalist, a royal biographer, author, broadcaster and public speaker. I was saying to you off air that I'm actually slightly starstruck and I'm sure many of our viewers that are watching this from the UK now 
would recognise you because you're all over our telly. Gosh. You've been very, very busy. You've actually been busy over the past couple of years, but you're going to be exceptionally busy this weekend. But before we get into the coronation and all the pomp and ceremony and what we should expect, I would like to know a little bit about you, if that's OK, because you're always talking about the royals. We never hear about you and you are an accomplished woman. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where the love for the royal family came from? OK, well, I always loved the royal family. When I was a small child, I always asked my parents if I would ever go inside and have a cup of tea with the Queen. But, um, you know, that obviously never happened. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go to university, so I started doing all sorts of odd jobs and I hated them all. <laughs> and um, in the end, one day I was sent to the Observer because the somebody was unwell and they wanted someone to run around. And I suddenly felt this is what I really want to do. So I stayed with them for a very long time. I had my own column after a year or so. And it was all about interviewing people. That's what I really love, you know, to a sort of jigsaw of what they really like. And I did lots of um, people who are very well known in all sorts of different areas of life. And I interviewed, um, I then decided I needed to write books. So I did, I wrote, I think it must have been about 20 years ago, a book about Diana's parents and background and I got more and more interested and then I decided and then I was moved over to the mail online um, to the daily mail and I did same thing about people who'd had horrible experiences lost a child were accused of raping a girl when you know that didn't really happen or it did happen you know all that so I moved away from celebrities to that and Talking about people who are in real pain is quite difficult because if you ask too many uh, questions, they get annoyed and they tell you to go home. Yeah. And if you don't ask enough, you'll be in trouble with the editor. Yeah. And then um, one of the um, people who worked at the Mail left to be editor of Newsweek. And he rang me up and said, I think you'd like to do some very long interviews. Why don't you come along and we'll think about it? So I did, I hadn't thought about it. And when he said at the time, who do you want to interview? My mind went blank. Mm. And then I thought, Prince Harry would be very interesting because I think he's coming out of his naughty boy um, time. Huh, little did I know. <laughs> and, um, you know, he would be interesting to talk to. He's got more responsibility and all that. Mm. So I wrote a piece about him and I was with him for um, 15 months. Wow. We got on very well. I used to interview him at the palace and I used to go on loads and loads of engagements with him. Goodness. And I found him charismatic. I thought he was very much like his mother in talking to people who were physically and emotionally. And it was genuine. Yes, I did feel he was yeah. genuine and very good at jokes and a um, really nice chap with a little bit of irritation about him, but then a lot of us have that. Yeah. Um, and so then a publisher wanted to make it into a book, so we talked a bit more and it turned out as a biography. came out in 2018 and I was asked by CNN to be one of the few uh, presenters of the wedding with uh, Meghan Markle. Uh, it was the most brilliant day. Wow. Um, sun was shining. Was uh, everyone was so happy. Yes. And I worked from 4 a.m. till 10 p.m. And the, all I had all day was a banana because I was so excited and I had to concentrate so hard. That's what I did. And I thought, well, that's good. And at Newsweek, they said, oh, we'd like to do another interview. And I decided I wanted to do the then uh, Camilla Parker Bowles and I thought that maybe she's coming out of that time when she's been so attacked yeah. and talked about as being you know the hated woman in the country the and mistress. so on and so I, I um, went to meet her for three months I spent time with wow. her she astonished me I never thought she was so nice and uh, easy to talk to Goodness. and I said to her aides, you know, can I join her on something? Say, what would you like to see? I said, anything she would like me to come to. And they said, well, she's going to a raping cent rape centre mm. and she wants to spend a day talking to the girls. And I thought, gosh, 
a royal going to talk to women who've had such a terrible experience. Mm -hmm. What can you say? You know, where were you going on a holiday? Did you have a nice weekend? You know, absolutely out of it. Yeah. So um, I went and she, it was really funny. I got there early, you have to, before the royal person comes along. And I said to the women there, you know, are you pleased? Looking forward to it. I said, no, I couldn't care less. I don't know what she's bothering about. I thought, oh dear, this is going to be hard. Anyway, she climbed up the a back uh, metal stairway and through the window because it was a safe house and she didn't want anyone to know. And she came in roaring with laughter at herself because it was just such a funny thing to see her walk yeah. through the window. And she then talked to all the girls, all the women, and after she'd finished, she was going to the next one and I was going to join her there. I went round to a few of them I'd spoken to before and they said, um, you know, five minutes with her was better help than six months with a someone, a, a therapist. Yes, mm. wow. So, and, and that I... made me more and more interested. And then because of those two books, I've been doing lots and lots of broadcasts all around that's the world. And I'm that's, very That's grateful. how we know you. We're going to ask more about Camilla uh, later in the discussion, but for the purpose of our viewers, millions of viewers that are watching this from Nigeria and across Africa, who probably haven't been inundated as we have in London about Saturday. Can you please explain in all its glory what the significance and the symbolism of Saturday will mean? not just for the royal family, but for Britain and for the entire Commonwealth. Yes. I think it's very interesting that we really love our monarchy. Most of us do. There's obviously people who don't, but the ones who do, they feel them that they're almost part of your family. You see the little children, you see them grow up, get married, and you are sad when things don't work out and, and some older royals die. And it, it gives us stability. And um, the best example I have was during COVID, when um, I was terrified, everyone was. We were locked up, we weren't allowed to go out, and we didn't know what would happen and how long this terrible pandemic would last. And then the Queen came on, and she spoke to us and said, these things will pass, we will meet again, yes. you know, it'll all work out. And I've... I'm quite a cynical person, you have to be if you're a journalist. Yes. And I thought to myself, I just I feel much better. I thought, Why am I expecting her to help me? And in a way, it's a sort of motherly touch yeah. that she had. We lost and, that. Pardon? We lost that. We've lost that. Mm -hmm. But she does, I think that's what's embedded in the royal family. They are there to serve. It's not about me, me, me. It's not about gaining power. It's actually to do what you can for other people. And I think in this day and age, we're so unused to that, mm -hmm. that we're very grateful that they they do it. People complain about the money, but actually it costs every taxpaying person one pound twenty five a much. year. Well, you know, it's less than a cup of coffee. Yeah. And um, I think that we're very we're very used to them. And what would be the alternative? We don't want some washed out prime minister doing it or a showbiz person or someone um, strong politically uh, or has a big company because it's not the same. It's about them and they're used to a very different structure in their life. Mm. But the royal families come and do their duty. They, are, uh, they help people who are in need and they um, try their best to to be an example. Obviously, there's some within the, the royal family that are no examples whatsoever. But a lot of them, if you think they don't have any privacy, they give all their time to the country and to the Commonwealth. Uh, I think it is extraordinary. Coming up on Channel's Business Global, I'll be sharing more from my interview with the award-winning journalist and royal biographer, Angela Levin. You won't want to miss it. Welcome back to Channel's Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinka, from our studios here in London. In case you needed reminding, tomorrow, Saturday the 6th of May, the coronation of King Charles III will be taking place at Westminster Abbey. There will be 2,200 guests inside the church, and the weekend's events are thought to have cost the UK taxpayer 
anywhere between 100 and 250 million pounds. As you can see from these images, preparations are well underway. Now, before the break, I was speaking to Angela Levin, the award-winning journalist and royal biographer. Let's now pick up where we left off. We've been speaking extensively um, about King Charles, as we should, it's his day, but it's also Camilla's day. I've actually got a daughter called Camilla, oh. uh, so she'll be anointed nice on, on Saturday too. Um, I want you to talk about your new book, Camilla, From Outcast to Queen Consort. Yes. Angela, sincerely and genuinely, has her popularity turned around the way the British media, the establishment, are trying to say it has. Because if you go on social media, you know, she has been trending for all of the wrong reasons over the past couple of weeks. Yes, I think a lot of people are attacking her about anything. And um, people have emailed me and said, how can you possibly write yep. this? Um, because she killed Diana. She didn't kill Diana. Diana didn't have a seatbelt on. She was being driven by a man who was drunk and drugged. And she had refused Prince Charles, as he was then, his offer to pay for her to have protection. She didn't want it. And that was a terrible big mistake. Um, the other thing is that, if anything, I blame King Charles's grandmother. He loved her very much, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. But she and Diana's grandmother, Lady Fermoy, um, had a deal that they would try and get this married together. Now, you have to remember that at the time, Charles was 30 years old. His parents were very angry that he hadn't got married, that he hadn't brought an heir to the throne. For the Queen, it was vital that they're heirs to the throne, so the throne keeps on going. And um, he, was, he, was, he was very keen to please them. He just felt he'd let his father down and also his mother, and he would do anything that he wanted. He didn't love Diana? Um, well, he did love her, but in a way that she was a bubbling young girl. OK. 12 years younger than himself. Beautiful. They, beautiful, indeed. Yes. They had nothing in common. Mm. And because Diana had a very, very difficult uh, childhood, um, she was quite damaged too, and she was already cutting herself Goodness. before Charles. Mm. And so she was mentally disturbed, and he didn't know how to handle that. Right. Very difficult for him. Um, but the grandmothers didn't say that she was very damaged. So they had 13 dates, mainly over dinner in Buckingham Palace. Was he dating Camilla at the time too? No, no. Um, well, he met Camilla when he was 22 and she was 24. And his great uncle, Old Mount Patton, said, it's fine you're with her, but don't think of her as anything else because it's not going to grow. Why? Because in those days, and we're talking about the 70s, and it's very hard to remember, that if you were marrying the heir to the throne, you had to be a virgin. Mm. And poor Diana was taken to a doctor, to a specialist, to check. Goodness me. She was a virgin, yes. Now we couldn't imagine that. Um, so she was OK, and his parents would accept it. Camilla, who was not, and who had been dating, um, her, what became her first husband, Andrew Parker Bowles. He's invited, isn't he? He'll be He's there on invited, Saturday. invited, yes. She's a very forgiving person. She doesn't... Um, resent people. She's forgiven Harry? She will forgive Harry. She will, if he wants to come back, she will forgive him because she said to me that time changes things. And so she's not someone who wants to get her own back and revenge. But what hurts her is that he's really hurt his father. And what hurts King Charles hurts. is that he's really hurt Camilla. Yeah. So it's very difficult. Harry described her as being dangerous. Yeah, I mean, it's complete nonsense. That wasn't Meghan's words as well, that was his words. Yes, spare. but I mean, sometimes Meghan might have given him these words. Possibly. Yeah. Um, she's the least dangerous woman. She loves people. She's very caring. and But she's not technical at all. And if you imagine that she would be ringing newspapers like Diana did to call them around, that's absolutely... Not, not her, true. maybe, Angela, maybe her staff. No, no. You don't believe any no, of that? No, I don't believe any of that. Partly because she doesn't like being in the spotlight. Mm. She likes to do things um, at behind the screens. And she 
I've heard so many stories that she's done for people that she doesn't want to come out because she's not someone who wants to say, look at me. The thing is that she absolutely adores King Charles and he adores her. So this is a sort of amazing love story. She doesn't want it for her. She really doesn't mind what crown she wears. She really doesn't mind um, anything that it would, is, would please him. She used to go around in tracksuit trousers and just a sort of a I've seen her jumper. in anything like that. Yeah. Um, but she realised that once she was getting into the royal family, she needed to scrub dress up. accordingly, yes. exactly scrub <laughs> up. And it took a year for her to work out what sort of things she wanted to do. She didn't want to look like, you know, 50 looking like 30. pretend <laughs> she was 30. Um, so it, it took her a year. And if you notice, when she's out working on engagement, and um, she wears navy blue in some form or another. Mm. It's really funny. I think it's her uniform. Oh, right. Um, and she thinks that's what's appro appropriate. Can I ask just two two questions in one, but if you can make it brief for me, Angela. Did, did the Queen love Camilla? And why can't she just be the Queen Consort? Why does she have to be Queen? Ah. Are the public going to accept her as Queen? Well, the Queen Consort actually means very little, except that she will never take over the reins of the royal. Right. Um, when, if Prince King Charles dies, it's not really um, something that the Queen would want to go to stay with her once she was Queen. Right. Um, it means that you are there to support the monarch. But that's all she needs to be, isn't it? Why does she have to be Queen on Saturday? Because if you're, you marry a King, you become a Queen. Okay. But actually, she is still a consort. But um, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was a consort. Right. Queen Mary before her was a consort. Uh, Prince Philip was a consort. It just means it's the other person. So it's just to make it easier to say nothing changes about what she's involved in, her position, her power. It's just a way of saying she's there to help him and support him, but she's not going to sit on the king's throne. We're going to have to invite you back on, by the way. Good. Um, but, <laughs> Angela, so what is your prediction for, for Prince Harry and the royal family and Meghan? Do you think the marriage is going to last? I never thought the marriage would last because really? I do Even believe... Even when you were there that beautiful day? I was day. there that... No, that beautiful day I was fine. That okay. beautiful day I thought it you was You did believe wonderful. in it. You believed in it. But before that beautiful day, yeah. I had gone with them on their first outing. Oh, so you've met engagement. them. You've met her. Yeah, and um, it was Nottingham, and it was the first one that Harry took me to. So oh, wow. he obviously quite liked me as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, we'll send him this clip. Um, but uh, she pushed in front of him, oh. and um, she was so capable that it was too far, you know, she had it all organised. But when they went up to meet various people, she pushed in front of him and went to talk to them, leaving Harry behind. And I thought that she wasn't even engaged then. I thought that was a bit out of order. Yes. And that's come out and she's in control of him. He adores her, which is very nice, but he wants to please her and it pleases her not to have anything to do with the royal family, I'm afraid. Yeah, that is, it, it's, it's, it's quite disheartening, although we've all got our own skeletons in our family, <laughs> don't we? Yes, but yes. Um, I think this one, this one really does hurt. It's, it's be, heartbreaking, it really actually. Is hot, but it would be really great because to see. Because if, if they wanted to go and leave, the Queen was quite happy about that, yes. so was the senior royal, other senior royals. Um, they wanted to be independent, that's fine. You know, they were very lucky. They had a huge house with 16 bathrooms. They had a little boy and then a little girl. They adored each other, allegedly. Yeah. And so what do you want? Don't keep living in the back. Don't keep earning your money from being incredibly nasty and unkind about the royals when they can't answer back. They yeah. don't. The Queen always said, don't explain, don't complain. Yes. And I think that's what's really sad. OK, they did it once, but not... All the Constantly. time. That's the way they're making their money. You know, as I was saying again off camera, Nigeria shares a very special relationship with Britain. Uh, we all cannot wait to watch the coronation. We wish King Charles III and Queen Camilla all the best. And we do want to see reconciliation. I think anybody with a difficult family knows it can be complicated. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, celebrating love and togetherness is wonderful. So well, Angela... had a lovely time as well. Brilliant. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Angela Levin, your book, your biography of Camilla, if anybody wants to learn more about her, From Outcast to Queen Consort, is available 
now, isn't it? Yes. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll be seeing you earlier tomorrow, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. for a coronation special broadcast. And for Channel's Business Global viewers, I'll be seeing you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channel's Business Global. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.